Hi, this is Chef Rick Moonen interviewing from my studio in Las Vegas. The name of my podcast is Ocean Raised. Here is where we get to dive deep into storytelling with the original gangsters of cuisine and find out where they started and what drives them today. Um, I connect with a deep wealth of knowledge today, uh, great talent, conviction to where we source our food, and maybe most of all, purpose. Um, Italian cuisine is what he's known for, but that's not his only forte. You'd recognize him in a heartbeat if you saw him walking down the street. This is Chef Scott Conant. He brings flawless technique to an unwavering passion to creating soulful food in a convivial atmosphere. With a career spanning more than 35 years, a portfolio of acclaimed restaurants, cookbooks, television shows, and an ever-expanding brand, Conant has established himself as one of the world's leading chefs. A graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, Conant built a reputation for outstanding leadership and culinary creativity early in his career, running the kitchens of famed Italian spots such as Il Toscanaccio, Toscanaccio Chianti and City Eatery, all of which earned glowing reviews uh, throughout his tenure. And just remind me to speak about Tony May when we're, when we're, when we're talking. Absolutely. Conant officially put his name on the map in 2002 when he opened the beloved Limpero in Manhattan, which garnered a three-star review from the New York Times, the title of Best New Restaurant from the James Beard Foundation and praised from top publications such as Gourmet and Food and Wine. This is the time where, I, where, where Scott came upon my, on my radar screen at Limpero, an amazing restaurant, and food was just outrageous. Following the success of Limpero, uh, Scott opened Alto, an elegant Italian restaurant in Midtown Manhattan to great acclaim, and in 2004 was named Best New, Sh Best New Chef by Food & Wine. Always looking to raise the bar, Conant eventually moved to bring his own version of sophistication time cooking to life. While no longer affiliated, Scott opened Scarpetta in New York City, which was nominated by the James Deere Foundation in early 2009 for Best New Restaurant in America. Conant went on to build the Scarpetta brand to national acclaim with restaurants in New York City, Miami, Toronto, Los Angeles, and my hometown, Las Vegas, and published the Scarpetta cookbook, inspiring the, uh, inspired by the dishes that he did in the restaurant. In February 2017, he opened Mora Italian, a modern Osteria in Phoenix, Arizona in April 2018. He debuted Italian Steakhouse Chilayo and Resorts World Catskills in Monticello, New York, and in October 2020, Conant expanded his Arizona restaurant portfolio after taking helm of the Americano, an Italian-American dining destination in Scottsdale, Arizona. Slated for spring in 22 this year, a second location of the Americano will open in the newly renovated intercontinental Buckhead Atlanta in Georgia. Scott is known for, uh, by fans worldwide for his food network appearances, including his long-running role as a judge on Chopped for over a decade now. In 2019, he began hosting the dessert-themed spinoff, Chopped Sweets, and has also served as the host of Best Baker in America, Seasons 2 and 3, and finally, co-host of Beat Bobby Flay, <laughs> which is a lot of fun just to make fun of Bobby Flay, I'm sure. <laughs> in addition, Conant has made frequent guest appearances on The Today Show, Rachel Ray Show, The Kelly Clarkson Show, and Good Morning America, amongst many, many others. In addition, to uh, the Scarpetta cookbook, uh, Scott has published uh, New Italian Cooking, Bold Italian, and in 2021, Peace, Love, and Pasta, Simple and Elegant Recipes from a Chef's Home Kitchen. Uh, the latter, Conant's fourth and most personal cookbook, delves into the evolution of how his cooking has changed throughout his career and how his connection to food has strengthened because of his deep family relationships. The book showcases the foods Scott grew up with and those he makes for his loved ones today. Of uh, offering restaurants quality style meals that emphasize the beauty of simple, fresh, and flavorful Italian dishes. It also includes authentic Turkish recipes as an homage to his wife's Mel's heritage and brings stories about his life growing up in New England with Southern Italian roots. Uh, as Chef Conan embarks on new opportunities, he looks forward to continuing his, to share his enduring philosophy that emphasizes the beauty of simplicity. So, Scott Conant, what a pleasure to have you uh, today on uh, Ocean Raised, my podcast. Your career goes on and on and on. And what I like to start off with. So does, so does that bio. I, I really got to have met it, that thing. 
<laughs> that's edited down. I know that already because, you know, if we went on about everything we did, it would be a two hour intro. We can't have that. You're, you, you don't need an intro because um, you've um, established and rightfully so deserve the uh, recognition and, and um, praise and support that you get from everyone in the industry and to every one of your guests that has the fortune of uh, walking into one of your restaurants and enjoying your incredible cuisine. But we all have beginnings. We all have roots. We all start somewhere. So where were you born, brothers and sisters? What was, the, what was it like growing up in the Connacht household as a youngster? So I grew up in, Water, in, in a small town outside of Waterbury, Connecticut. Called, it's a town called Oakville, Connecticut. And uh, my, my grandparents on my mother's side are off the boat from Italy. And my father's, a lot of people don't know this, but my, my father's family came to this country in 1620 and founded Salem, Massachusetts. So if you've ever been to Salem, there's a huge statue outside the Witch Museum of a, a, a huge statue of a guy named Roger Conant. And that was my great, 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 whatever, grandfather from, <laughs> from years back. And so, you know, I always say I am like a real blue, bo- blue blood wop. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? So, um, yeah, it's, I've never actually been to Salem, unfortunately, but it's a, it's a great story. And he was actually a food entrepreneur. I like to think of myself these days as a, a little bit of a food entrepreneur as well. He was in the salt business. And uh, half of the family went up to Maine where my father grew up on a farm. He grew up on a potato farm up in Maine. And my, the other half of the family kind of went on. And, and if, you know, I have uncle. I have an uncle who is the president of Harvard, for example, uh, James Bryant Conan. Um, he was instrumental in the Manhattan Project, all that kind of stuff. That was not at all the people that I grew up with. I grew up with <laughs> the, you know, the farmers and the salt of the earth Italians and and all that stuff. So I grew up eating, um, you know, some stuff that my father would cook that he grew up with on the farm. Uh, And also some, you know, a lot of stuff that my mother would cook and my aunt and and my whole, you know, my my mother's extended family of that really soulful Italian-American food that everybody, that everybody knows. How many in your family? I have an older brother and a younger sister. Um, And and if there's any, if there's any uh, therapist listening to this, me being the middle child, it kind of all makes sense. (laughs) I'm four out of seven, so I get it. I I, I feel your pain. But, there you, you know, go. what was it like in the house, though? Did you, when did you start cooking? What age? I mean, were you, I, I mean, obviously you were exposed from what I'm listening yeah. to, to great food. Your, your parents from That's right. Italy, and we all know the cuisine of Italy That's is, right. is off the charts uh, about quality and simplicity, really, you know? And it, yeah, yeah. It, so, it, you know, I was, I was very fortunate that uh, growing up, I, you know, I ate well. I was a chubby kid. I loved the food that I was eating. Husky. <laughs> I, husky. Yeah, husky. Husky. Yeah, we, that's where I shopped in that section of, <laughs> of Sears, the husky section. Yep. And, uh, you know, and I just, I, I fell in love with food. I was, I went to a vocational school in high school and I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Initially, I, I when I signed up for it all, um, I didn't know the direction it was going to go in, and uh, I signed up to be a plumber, but I couldn't get into the class because too many people had applied. If you know how vocational schools work, you have your choice of various uh, trades and, and vocations. So I could have done anything, right, from carpentry and, and hairdressing uh, to fashion design and you know, auto mechanics, hair, right? Well, thank you. That was my, <laughs> that was my third choice. My third choice was hairdressing, <laughs> but my first choice was plumbing and my second choice was culinary arts. And fortunately, um, I didn't get into the plumbing program. I, I got into the culinary arts program, but you well, know, thanks. I was, they were waiting, they were waiting in the wings for me with hairdressing. <laughs> So your, your siblings, um, did any of them get involved in the hospitality industry on any level? No, my brother's in marketing and my sister is an esthetician. Yeah. So like we all went, we all took very different paths. And I, when, once I started working at 15 years old, I, I worked at a family friend's restaurant and I was working, plus going to high school, I was working 60 hours a week, plus going to school. I would, mm-hmm. I just, abs- I mean, you know, that it, early on in, in our lives, right? You get bit by that bug. Mm-hmm. And the restaurant bug, and it's just, you know, that's what I needed to do. I didn't know where it was going to take me. I remember telling my mother, um, she was like, what do you mean you want to be a, 
like a cook, a chef, like, you know, that was just, you know, 1985. It was, you know, it was crazy. I'm going to be a hamburger flipper, according to my parents. That my my mother said to me like, what are you going to work at Friendly's? Your whole your whole life is you're going to work at like a you know a, one of those restaurants. Mm-hmm. So um, I you know I got I, I feel like I, I got really lucky that you know I'm not sure if it was luck or ambition or maybe a little bit of both, but I just I knew I needed to get out of, of Connecticut and, and I went to New York, and uh, I started working at San Domenico. As a matter of fact, when I was 19 as I was going to uh, CIA and I, I just, I fell in love with it and I, and I knew Italian food was the cuisine for me. What was Tony May like? Okay. Let's, let's pay a, a moment yeah. of homage to a man that I believe there's certain people in the, in our industry that will take what I, when I grew up, we went out for Italian food. There was yeah. never cuisine attached. It was Italian food. And what it was an yeah. American Spaghetti and meatballs, the typical, mm-hmm. you know, uh, red gravy uh, type of yeah. establishment. Tony May was the was the one individual that I remember uh, saying, "No, no, 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 no. This is this is high quality, high end. It is it is to be taken seriously." And um, he never looked back, and he succeeded yeah. tremendously. And you worked with him, right? I, I, I worked for about five years with Tony. Uh, I started at San Domenico. I went up to um, I went up to Westchester. He opened a restaurant up in Westchester outside New York City. Mm-hmm. And I worked there for a while. And then I came back to San Domenico. And I'll tell you, working with him was, you know, there were those moments where if he was unhappy about something, it wasn't very often that he would assert himself into the kitchen. But if he was unhappy, so he would come in, roll up his sleeves in a sport coat, Right, roll the <laughs> sleeves up and teach us. I remember he taught us how to make spaghetti vongole one time, and it was the best spaghetti with clams I'd ever had in my life. And I just had never seen it done that way. You know, it wasn't that you know liquidy sauce that you see sitting on the bottom of a plate. Mm-hmm. It was this beautiful infused emulsified sauce with the starch from the pasta cooked down with the juice of the clams, and it was and the oil and the really good oil and the garlic and the crushed red pepper. And, and it was just spectacular. And I, you know, he, I, you meet certain people in your life and you never realize the impact that they have on your, on your life and your career and your outlook on things mm-hmm. until, until you get older and you start to look backwards. And I, you know, he passed away the other day, God bless him. And uh, I didn't realize he was 84 years old. Uh, I reached out to Marissa, his daughter, just to send my condolences. But I would say he changed the trajectory of my life. Um, And we didn't have a lot of interactions. I was a line cook, right? It wasn't until I became a sous chef later on, years later, that uh, we started to speak. Um, And I I was fortunate enough to do a couple panel discussions with him um, over the years. And his passion uh, for what he was pursuing was unparalleled. I mean, he really, he really, you know, watching him, observing him, uh, Tony May had this drive in this, this incredible torch for carrying forward um, the unknown aspects of Italian cuisine. It was that really that alto cucina, that high end cooking that, um, that he was known for. And, you know, you think about Palio, you think about Sandro's, you think about La Camellia, you think about uh, San Domenico. Those are restaurants that were trendsetters. I mean, they really created a new standard, a new bar for Italian restaurants. And if it wasn't for Tony, I feel like guys like me wouldn't exist. Um, I don't think people like uh, even, you know, Joe Bastianich and his crew would be taking as taken as seriously. Lydia was part of Gruppo Ristoranti Italiani, which uh, which was the Italian restaurant group that Tony had had founded and brought into America and tried to raise the bar and the awareness of Italian cuisine throughout the country. And I think that he had that effect on the world because of it. He did it, man. He did it. Thank he God. Did. Thank God for Tony May. And. Uh, my condolences to his family and everyone. And Absolutely. It's, it's just, a, it's just unbelievable. So when did you strike out on your own? What, what was the first, uh, you're the executive chef, it's your baby, you're part of it, and it's all you? I um, had a, I did a restaurant in 1997 that I had taken over in 98. Uh, we kind of relaunched everything. Mm-hmm. It was called Chianti. It was on 55th and 2nd. It was the first review that I had ever gotten. It was the first time 
Uh, Ruth Rachel was the critic back then. You remember those days. Of course. Um, <laughs> Ruth, was, Ruth was the critic of the New, for the New York Times, and it was the first time anyone had written about my food uh, in a restaurant that I was working at. And I, I will never forget that feeling and that emotion. I was walking up 2nd Avenue. It was the Diner's Journal on, was that Friday afternoon, right? The yep, Diner's Journal. And yep. the, review, the review was on Wednesdays. And this was before the internet and all that stuff. So you had to go to the New York Times and get the paper. You remember those days? When oh, you, I remember sitting out there waiting for the first stay, paper to come out. Staying up all night, stressing out, you know, midnight, you send somebody to, <laughs> to the New York <laughs> Times to get tomorrow's paper. They bring back a whole stack of them and everybody's reading it inside the restaurant to see what happened. And, you know, those were, those were stressful times. And it was, it was just a different world. Um, that review meant everything. It meant success or failure. Right. It was all dependent on that perception uh, those days. And Ruth had given me a really positive diner's journal. And I remember just thinking to myself, like, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy for wanting to cook the food that I want to cook, where it wasn't super high end food. It was someplace where there was a rusticity to it. And I wanted that soulful aspect that we all love about Italian food um, to be balanced with some refined touches and elegant, luxurious ingredients and things like that. Um, and that was, and that was the, that was the moment. That was the validation yeah. that you, we've all, we're all, I mean, I can <laughs> almost, I almost memorized the first review I got. I mean, I read every <laughs> word it, until it burned a hole in the back of my head, you know? Yes. And of course there's criticisms just, you know, that broccoli was tired. I, mean, I lived my life tired broccoli, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because that's what you pull from it. What, that's what, we're that's what you pull. Yeah, yes. you want to know what, what's yes. gonna, what's gonna, what's gonna, uh, you know, make me a better uh, at what I do. You know, so it's <laughs> it's really what happened. So your your brothers and sisters went off in different directions. Obviously, they, they, I'm sure they're very proud of you. And um, you uh, graduated from the CIA. When did you graduate? I graduated in the first class. We had like three days. It should have been 91, but it was three days into 1992. So okay. technically it's a 92 graduation, but I should have graduated in 91. Yeah. yeah. But no, yeah. I mean, I, did, well, I graduated in 79. <laughs> no kidding. Was it 79? Huh? Wow. 76. I started by the, well, I graduated in 78 actually. And I stayed yeah. on as a fellowship, you know, under uh, Eugene Bernard, boom, boom, Bernard in the uh, Escoffier room. who just screaming. Oh, everybody. wow. But he was, he's, that's amazing. I consider him my mentor. Who, uh, who would you feel, who do you feel you would consider as your, uh, as your primary mentor in your career? You know, it's hard to say because I had so many people that I had worked with and worked for. Um, Tony May was definitely one of them. Uh, there was, you know, in in Las Vegas, Teo Schonegger. I worked for Teo for, for about four and a half years as well. Um, and I loved working with him. Paul Bartolotta, I worked with Paul for about, uh, it wasn't that long, six or eight months, something something along those lines. But it was, he was, he was working at, he was the chef at San Domenico at the time. And uh, I learned a lot from observing that entire situation. It was, uh, it was a lot, 1990 in Manhattan, and it was, you know, the most expensive pasta in town at San Domenico. Sure. And it was, uh, it was a bustling, busy restaurant that, uh, you know, you, you remember those days in, in the restaurant world, right? It was, there was something about the, you know, the, just the, there was this, electricity almost when you would open those doors and you didn't know who was going to be in the dining room that night. It was, you know, from Al Pacino to John Gotti, uh, from <laughs> Sophia Loren to Pavarotti would come in at night. Pavarotti every, every once a month or so he would come in and sit with, uh, Bruce Springsteen in the private room at like 10 30 at night. And they would sit and talk for hours until two, three o'clock in the morning. And we would stay there, First of all, we were so excited that Bruce Springsteen and Pavarotti were yeah, in the no house. Kidding. <laughs> and that's not necessarily a, you know, like a, a friendship that you would think about, <laughs> you know, the, the boss and the, and the best the, tenor in the world. <laughs> that's right. And, um, and, you know, we just, we just had a blast and it, there was a certain, it was an elegant restaurant. It was super fine dining. It was re really over the top. It was the first time, you know, growing up in a really lower middle 
middle class, lower middle class town like Oakville, Connecticut and Waterbury, Connecticut, where I went to school and worked and all that stuff. I saw it, you know, it was a table of six came in and they had spent $10,000 on dinner. And I thought to myself, like, this is crazy. I, I just never would think someone would spend 10. I mean, this was, you know, 1990, like I said, $10,000 on dinner for six people was insane. Yeah, it was insane. Well, back then there was, back then, I hate talking like the old guy, you know, but we're just, the old guys. It's we're okay. The, we're the it's original okay. gangsters, so we can talk about this. <laughs> stuff. Hey, how you doing? But the reality of it was, there was more of a culture. I really felt like what you said, the tangible, when you open the doors and you walked into a place, there was a culture in place and you knew it. Yes. You could feel it. There was soul, there was soulfulness in the food. There was there was tenderness in in the and not a pushiness to it, but there was a tenderness and a, and a, a professional a level of professionalism to the service that uh, was unmistakable, you know. And we were yeah. all fortunate to be just. I was too stupid to know I was in something that important. I really was. I was just yeah. in the middle of it. You couldn't see the forest through the trees. That's you right. did your sixty-hour work weeks or whatever. Well, it's funny how <laughs> luck comes to those that work these uh, these hours. You know, you work your ass off. Hey, you get kind of lucky, you know? And, yeah, it's um, funny how that works. <laughs> and you tend to be in the right places, you know? And um, Scarpetta. Tell me about Scarpetta. Yeah. So when I was uh, getting out of business with my old business partner at Limpato and Alto, I, I had this idea for a restaurant and a restaurant company. And I, you know, the writing was on the walls back then, even with independent restaurants and how difficult it is um, to... You know, it was already a changing uh, mm -hmm. back in, in, you know, this was 2008, 2007, 2008. It was, already, it was already changing inside the restaurant world. And so I wanted to kind of come up with a different ideation of what, what restaurants could be. And having spent, you know, a lifetime inside restaurants almost already at that point, I, I decided that there needed to be a better balance. And I'm, I, you know, I, I, there's, I, I live, a, I don't talk about this very often, but I live a pretty spiritual life. I'm, I've read a lot about Buddhism over, over the years and I, and I try to live, you see, I have, I have a big Buddha behind me and these things are really important to me. And, and Buddha always discussed and talked about the middle path. And I, and I always thought that there has to be a middle ground uh, with restaurants as well. There needs to be that middle path. Um, so my idea with Scarpetta was to really walk that fine line of what what that middle path means. And for me, it was it wasn't just the the food and bridging that gap between Alta Cucina and La Cucina Rustica. Mm -hmm. um, really fine dining kitchen with the with the rustic kitchen but also it was about that service element as well where we can focus on the the proper principles of fine dining and the the, the approach to the guest um but also do it in a way that it's a little more casual and it's serious but doesn't take itself too seriously and that was the entire idea of of scarpetta that i had taken um in in most importantly scarpetta the word is when you grab a piece of bread and kind of sop up what's on the plate so that was the intention that every recipe should invoke that emotion of it's so good you just grab a piece of bread and you sop up what's on the plate uh and that was that was my starting point and i feel like i sat with a friend of mine one time i was doing some stuff with uh hsn years ago and he was an on-air host his name is rich hollenberg he does uh, play by play now for the Tampa Rays in uh, in South Florida. So we were we were, you know, doing this stuff on the back of a napkin. And I said, I have this idea for a restaurant. Let me tell you about it. And I said, this is my ten year plan. And I wrote it all down. And I and I said this just on the back of the napkin. And I said, this is this is what I want to do. And um, I accomplished that in three years because it really resonated with people. I, I you know I. I should have saved that damn napkin. napkin. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the best ideas, ideas in the world start but, on a napkin you know, at a bar. <laughs> I, I think you're right. I think you're right. So uh, that was the idea of Scarpetta, and we captured it. And then I sold my shares of it and, and, and all that kind of stuff, and I'm not involved anymore. Right. Um, and I'm on to other things. And life has changed. But, you know, sometimes things don't work out the way you expect. And the only thing I could say to people, and I say this all the time, is it's not about – breathing yesterday's breath it really is about focusing on what didn't work leaving it behind taking the best of it and then trying to figure out what's next right but for me what was next was i needed to make sure that i put myself in a better situation i needed to put myself in a trajectory of 
growth constantly. And that not to sound like a motivational speaker or anything like that, Sounds but I really <laughs> truly believe that. I really believe that inevitably things aren't going to work out sometimes. There's, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing lasts forever, right? None of us get out of this alive. Nothing is going to last forever. Everything has a time for everything has a time frame on it with the exception of honey perhaps. So <laughs> that's the only thing that can last. No, exp no expiration. <laughs> no expiration date. So I, I often think to myself, if I can take that, that negative, right, the end of something and actually parlay it into some positive elements, then there's, then there's, there's, then you're never doing anything wrong. Then you have nothing to regret. Because you could just focus on the positive aspects of it. And Scarpetto was one of those things for me. It didn't work out the way I wanted it to work out, the way I saw it in my mind's eye. But I've made my life and my career better having done that than I would have if I were still in it, if that makes sense. Totally makes sense. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I've learned mostly from mistakes in my life, ultimately. You know, you, what you consider a mistake at the time. But as you get That's older, right. you realize... That was a major building block for me. I learned a real lot from that, you know. Absolutely. And How many times I've said to myself, if if I didn't ha if I didn't walk away from that, I would never be able to do this, 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 and this, and I would never be able to make this that I'm, you know, all the all the kind of stuff as you put it all together. There's really something to pull out of that, um, and of course, it's tough on the ego. But if we shed that aspect of our ego and really just focus on where we are right now. I really feel like that. It's it always works out for the best as long as you have the right mindset. That's inspiring. I, I mean, I, I take that very much to heart. Yeah. Um, my life right now, it's, just, it's incredible. I live in Las Vegas. I develop recipes yeah. in my kitchen at home for a company based out of Houston. I do some side things at the, the stadium here and then they yeah. at Allegiant. And I, I enjoy my life. I mean, I'll never retire. I don't even know what retire means, you know. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm also working with this company, Forever Oceans, which is a, a startup aquaculture company. I want to, I want to just kind of shift the, the conversation just a touch towards products and yeah. our interpretation of them, because we are the conduit towards production and consumption in many in many aspects. We're influencers and all the great names that that come up around it. But the bottom line is. Um, we're introducing people to a new style of cuisine all the time. I mean, like yes. we, just, we just proved that in the discussion of Italian food yeah. to cuisine, to Tony May and all the other factors. But product availability in the United States of America is very is very good, but we don't produce a lot uh, here or as much as we can. I mean, we, we've got a lot of uh, potential to produce even more beyond the borders, into the waters, et cetera. And even globally, but yeah. uh, aquaculture really got a bad name early on. And I was one of the, <clears throat> the loudspeakers saying, you know, salmon farmed and dangerous and certainly. I remember like, that. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and here I am today. You know, I'm not talking out of two sides of my mouth. What I'm doing is just yeah. getting excited about um, the changes that have, yeah. uh, that have come in the world of aquaculture, the, the, the methods of farming, the sensitivity towards the environment. The, the word sustainability, which I hate because it's already been diluted down to nothingness, yes. to whatever somebody wants to use to promote and, uh, and, and push themselves forward, even though it doesn't make any sense in the, the real meaning of the word as it originated. So we get to become this uh, gatekeepers. So aquaculture. I remember a part of my career. I was like, no freaking way. Man, there's yeah. plenty of there's plenty of uh, seafood and there's a lot of biomass in the ocean, but unfortunately, we as a, as, a, as a culture only like a select few of those. Yeah. So there was an inevitable um, need and change and shift towards aquaculture to the point where today we consume globally more than fifty percent of what we eat comes from farms. So that being said, and wow. and, and, and and farms doing a better job. I'd just like to hear your. Your, your, your own personal, um, you know, interaction with that type of evolution of, of aquaculture and how you feel about it. Oh, my God. There's so much stuff happening right now. I feel like it's impossible to keep up with it all because it's moving so quickly. And you, you are far, you're much more well-versed, I, I would imagine, on those things than I am. Um, but I was, I was recently, I was tasting some hamachi uh, that's, that's 
kind of this new idea of the farm where everything is tagged that it's in these giant takes and it actually goes through the ocean, right? Is that, is that, uh, that's not forever ocean. They, they, they have, that's not, they, they that's have not forever. It's a different one. That's all right. There's a lot of different yeah. um, products out there. And this is yeah. Hamachi, uh, the, the, the Forever Oceans Hamachi. The thing that I like about it is the company and yeah. its integrity. The, um, the, the original CEO, who's now in charge of just sustainability of the company to make sure that they're actually giving back to the environment more than they're taking out of it, which is yeah. one of the reasons that I was very much attracted to. I mean, I love Hamachi. Okay. So, so important. It, yes. You know, I, I definitely want to get you some uh, samples of this product, but Please. It, it, it's Please. It, a lot of times it's the story behind the food. You know, it's, a, it's, it's about the integrity and the care that goes into the production. So it's just not, you know, we destroy as we go through sometimes, you know, we, we just, and we just leave a wake of, of, of you know, crap behind us that uh, someone else is going to have to deal with. It, was a, it seemed that was the mentality many years ago. Yeah. But today, everybody's being held accountable as we have, you know, global warming and all the other fun things. Migration yeah. doctors are going north. Cod went north in the East Coast. You know, on the West Coast has the same, uh, you know, challenges and, and issues. So it's, it's, it's yeah. interesting to find, for me, anyway, I mean, uh, you, you, you give me the uh, accolade of knowing more. I don't know about that. I just it's become a single subject focus of mine because I, I want to know where my food comes from. I want yeah. to know the story behind it, you know, and uh, when, when people have some sort of opposition to it, you can explain to them, well, this is, this is the reality of it, you know, and, and, and it's, it's been fun to, for me to start out as a cuisinier. I'm still a cuisinier. Yeah. We're all just cooks at the end of the day. Absolutely. But, 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 but Absolutely. How, how you take, communicate and share that knowledge is, is really kind of what sets us apart. Um, aquaculture for you i mean did you i mean i remember back in the day it just really wasn't much out there it was it was kind of like salmon then yeah we, we had barramundi we had a, stri a hybrid striped bass there's uh you know of course we know the farm raised catfish and tilapia stories mm -hmm. but there's uh today there's a lot more interesting this forever oceans is looking into as a secondary uh, and perhaps tertiary of a grouper and red snapper these are interesting species to see uh, enter into the aquaculture arena in farms that are far enough offshore that they're not interfering with the higher concentration of biomass, which is definitely close to the shoreline. So the further out you get, yeah. the less populous uh, in, 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 so interference uh, when you put a farm in there that you're going to see. Yeah. And, and we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. And our government's getting more involved. NOAA is becoming a lot more involved with all the massive amounts of information that they've been acquiring yeah. over the many years. They create these templates for better areas to put aquaculture in the United States offshore, which is beyond the three mile mark, you know, so that, uh, you know, the state, state, state has jurisdiction out three miles and then three miles to 100 and 200 miles out is federal. And so there's, there's some interesting things going on as, as, as we uh, go through and, and how it impacts us as chefs is, is going to be, uh, is, is very, very interesting. I, I just want to see people get excited about companies that are doing a better job, the products Absolutely. That, that, that they're coming out with. And to me, that's, you know, one of the, the the few hats that I wear when I'm, you know, going through my my career. You know, and it's it's so it's so imp it's so important what you're talking about and the responsibility, uh, not just of the of the owners of those businesses, but as chefs that we have the responsibility to cook the right food. Right? I mean, it's not just about making sure our food costs are in line anymore. Right? It really has to be a little bit more of a responsible approach. Um, and and some of the and, and you're right. Some of the farm raised stuff has gotten a really bad reputation over the years. But it's, I feel like we've turned the page from all those things, and it really is about that awareness that you're talking about. That everyone can be better informed. Not not just me. Every every everyone. What you know? What we're buying? Where we're buying it from? Where it comes from? The effect that it has on the environment. You know, it's almost like now we're relying on machines to do the work that the earth would do for itself, right? And it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me when we're, when, you know, we're building machines to, well, you know, to you create know, fresh water when that fresh water is here for us. You you're know? a spiritual yeah. individual, you know, Buddhism and, and working with what nature would do and looking for solutions that 
uh, would answer the question, what would happen naturally? What would nature do if this were to happen? You know, let's just yeah. say, uh, you know, a million salmon decided to move into the Bay of Fundy because they found out that that's where the greatest place in the world is. So now there's a stress on the environment. What would nature do? You know, with the with the effluent, the extra byproduct of of, of that concentration of uh, of biomass in in areas such as the Bay of Fundy, and that's what excites me most when yeah. these companies look towards uh, that solution. In other words, like there's different types of aquaculture you can you can grow. Uh, fin fish in this particular area, but there's a lot of byproduct. But there's a lot of things that would benefit from that byproduct. So we can we can plant kelp next to it, and kelp will pull some of that high concentration nutrition that turns to be toxic at that that, that that concentration. But kelp doesn't mind it. Kelp loves it. Grows like crazy. And so now you got all this kelp. Now it's tangling up the ocean. You know. Well, you can you can also have uh, mussels and, and and other animals that and and. and sea urchin, et cetera, they yeah. can feed off it. And so then you create this multi-trophic aquaculture system uh, that's integrated. So it's IMTA, Integrated Multi-Trophic Aquaculture. That is of extreme excitement to me because finally we're trying to stop fighting Mother Nature and work with Mother Nature and produce food that is of great quality, that makes sense to us as cuisiniers that want to turn it into a, you know some creative dish to our to, 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 to present to our, to our guests. And, you know, that with the culture in which we were brought up in, I think it's yeah. really lays on, it, it falls in our laps in a way because that culture has evolved. It has changed. It's become more stripped down. I mean, we grew up in an environment that was a little bit what people would consider today harsher. You know, there was, there was, right. there was, there was hazing, there was razzing, there was words <laughs> being pushed around that weren't complimentary that would offend most people rather than motivate them to try harder the next day. And I'm not going to go through that experience again. So those days have changed. The culture has changed. And I believe that what can we leave behind as the original gangsters that's going to help perpetuate the culture that we had the privilege of growing up in. In, in an environment that is very much in a cancel culture, because if, if you say the wrong word, the wrong way to the wrong person, next thing you know, you're out. Yeah. What do you say yeah. to that? I mean, I mean, what, what do we do? It's, what, what can well, we? I, you know, you know, I, I, I'm faced with this a lot, right? I still have four restaurants, five restaurants. I'm opening another one and I'm looking to do more. Um, and, one of those one of those things is you know the sensitivity uh, the sensitivity factor and being sensitive to the sensitive. I grew up a very sensitive child, mm -hmm. and I often say that um, I was told, particularly by my father, "You're too sensitive." You know, drill that into me. You're too sensitive, and I and as I take a step back, and now I'm a little older, I feel like that sensitivity made me good at what I do, right? And so that same sensitivity that we can approach one another with. Mm -hmm. uh, I really feel that if we can, if we could just kind of get out of our own way, forget the harsh words, focus on the fact that we're all sensitive here. How do we, how do we, how do we create an environment for ourselves where we're utilizing that sensitivity for betterment of one another, as well as for most importantly for the guest, right? And I and I, I often think about back in the '60s, in the early '70s, the the '60s '70s, that. The youth of then, right, which are which are older now, mm -hmm. they they were trying to say something. And most, for the most part, the elder, um, you know, the the older generations were all trying to trying to ignore that or tell them you're out of your mind, this, that, and the other thing. I really try to put myself in a position where even if I disagree with some of the things that are being spoken about, it's coming from another generation, and, and it really is important to them. And it's a challenge sometimes, right? It's a challenge. I really have to like <laughs> challenge myself here because I think like it's really easy to dismiss it and say, you guys are crazy. You don't understand anything, right? As, <laughs> as older, as older, particularly older white guys, that's what we tend to do. Like, you don't understand anything. Shut your mouth, get to work. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know what I mean? But I have a, I have a 12 year old daughter who is wildly sensitive to the things that people say and particularly the way people are, are treated. And I, I find myself having a tremendous amount of respect for that. I, to, to, when I listen, her name is Isla. When I listen to Isla speak, 
when she's talking about certain things, when she's talking about, you know, uh, gay rights, about, you know, social issues, about racial issues, whatever it is, she comes at it from a point of, it's not about her, right? It's about, we need to listen to people who are in these situations and whether it be, you know, trans issues, whatever the case may be, these are people that we come across on a daily basis. We work with these people. We, we, we are these people. We, we love these people, whatever the case, whatever the case may be. But I think being open and sensitive to the conversation is the first step towards betterment. I think it all starts there. Yeah, you know? I agree. I, I, I say the uncomfortable truth for me. Um, and I was, I'm, Number four of seven children. Yeah, my, uh, I I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself. I just yeah. I was driven. I was very hyper. I had that going for me. I, I can work <laughs> long hours. Yeah, I, I can definitely uh, push very hard doing it, and, and and always wanted to succeed at what I did. But it was a certain lack of uh, that confidence that made me a better communicator with people. You know, um, I I wanted to better myself, like you said. You know, you said yourself. We're always. Take, take yesterday's breath and let it, let it blow off into the wind and take, right. take a new breath today and, and do, do better with what you do have. You know, I learned a lot from mistakes, but it was that, you know, you go in the dining room and I'm sure this has happened with you yourself. You go to tables, you touch tables. You, you might touch 20 tables in a night when then four each yeah. or then you've, you've just touched 80 people really in, in essence. Yeah. And they were, Oh, the food is so great. This is so good. How much of that do you believe? In your head, you got your own inner conversation going, yeah, so just, you know, like, <laughs> it, kind of, it kind of scorched the bones. That's so, right. uh, you yeah. don't get that bitterness. Okay. You know, yeah. and, and it's that, in, I call it. It's true. It, it's true, man. It's, it's your own self-governor. It's, it's, it's an insecurity <laughs> that, that kind of works, you know, keeps you. Yeah. Nah, I don't believe that. I'm going to keep trying harder because I don't believe that, you know. And that is, I think, yeah. the the qualities that make a, a, a successful uh, chef. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I think that's going to make anyone successful, regardless of what they do to constantly second guess themselves to not to focus on the negative, mm -hmm. but to be aware of the negative, to understand where you are. One of the things I used to do really early in my career um, was I would spend my last dime eating out in restaurants, yeah. your restaurants. I remember going to Les Penas and spending a lot more money than I, <laughs> I think I'm still, I think I'm still paying that one off. Right. But I, <laughs> you know, and I, and I, and I think to myself all the time, when I was eating these dinners, I would think to myself, where am I on the spectrum? Like mm -hmm. if I'm really going to be honest with myself and maybe it's a completely internal conversation, um, where do I stand here? That's one of the reasons why I traveled so much. That's one of the reasons why I eat out all the time. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to be mentioned alongside with those other restaurants because, because I, I, because I was working on getting there. Right. I, I remember, do you remember, uh, Laurent Turndell opened up a restaurant called cello years yes. ago? Yes. Right. Yeah. I remember going there for dinner and thinking to myself, like, how do you create this like he was he was incredible i didn't know i didn't know 20 ingredients on that menu 20 i mean i'd go <laughs> in and i'd read the whole thing and i'm like this is yeah. my life i and and there was like well, i don't know what that is i don't know what that is we didn't have the internet you didn't just go Siri, yeah. tell me what the hell you know yeah this is this ingredient. so humbling so humbling yeah Dang. that big door yeah. too that was a big door the, yeah, I mean, there was something about <laughs> restaurants like that at the time where they had the beautiful private dining room upstairs and then the really intimate small dining room downstairs. You know, he would have gotten, if they had lasted a little bit longer, I think they closed in two, in 2001 or two, if I remember abrupt. correctly. It was a quick closure. But, um, and, and by the way, that's a perfect example of here's a guy who then parlayed that negative into another positive, created all the BLT, BLT yeah, yeah, yeah. spin off of that. Now he's doing his own thing. He's in, Laurent is incredibly successful, wildly talented, uh, probably doesn't get the, you know, the, the, the press that he should get. He doesn't mm. get the, the mentions that he should get um, because he's, he's part of the conversation and he's an incredible chef who's also taken all the, a lot of negatives in career and turned them into 
big, big positives on him. He was ahead of his time with cello, I think. That's what happened. People weren't ready to uh, accept that level. And I think I mean, yeah. he was away uh, on vacation. Some came back and the, the place was closed on him. It, it, that's there's, right. a, there's a lot that's more right. politics that went on there. And that's, that's a great right. that's a great example of someone that took that negative and turned it into an incredible positive. Absolutely. I mean, LT is, is a brand that we all know and, and respect. Absolutely. My gosh, I remember people used to work for him. I used to hear the inside stories and all that. It was tremendous. I was jealous. Yes. I wanted to be yeah. there you know it's, yeah it's it's um uh, it's it's an amazing career and we were both in new york city at the same time i didn't uh get to know you as well as i wish i had but i'm glad that yeah. i get the opportunity to speak with you now and to get to know you as a peer yeah and um it's 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 never a boring um industry because there's always this evolution going on and, and taking place and I don't. I don't know what's next. Everybody's. What's next? What's next for you? It's. It's a matter of what's yeah. going on in your own little life. You know. I just. I'm fortunate that I um, did not own a restaurant during the, uh, the past couple of years. I woke up every morning thanking God that I was actually an employee of a company that had culture and integrity. Yes. I was with a great team, and um, I don't know what the future holds anymore. I know. I just yeah. bought a house in uh, uh, North Fort Myers, so I'm gonna be moving to florida we're not moving to but have a home out nice. there as well so i can good for you now i can balance like you said balancing you got to balance everything so you balance that uh desert with a little bit yep. of water and then uh, nothing get, wrong with that the happiness that you know we, we all hope to have what what is yeah. what is the ultimate for you what what, what is ah i did it i got it <laughs> I, you I, know and that's a tough question because i know it is a tough stop. question because people always say what you know how do you identify you know People say all the time, you're successful. But successful means different things to different people. And for me, I feel like I've had successes. I wouldn't call myself successful because I have too many things to do. Somebody came to me recently. They wanted to do an honor an honor dinner for me. I'm oh, like, wow. you guys... You guys think I'm dying? Like I, <laughs> I got, I got a long time for that. I am. I don't want. I said no to him. Said, wait till I'm in concert. To <laughs> <laughs> way too young for that stuff. I mean, I got too many things to do. I, uh, I, I, you know, I don't want to work as hard as I used to. Those yeah. ninety hundred hour work weeks. I just, I don't want to do it. I, and I was doing it prior to COVID, and I feel like the great reset for me during during this entire pandemic has been, you know, kind of. I think you have one or two choices, right? Fortunately, I had a little bit of money in the bank, thank God, because yeah. you know, right, how hard it is. But I, what I did was, I, I came home. And I looked around my house and I said, I never get to spend time here. I moved to Scottsdale about five years ago and not dissimilar to, to Vegas, right? It's really hot, yeah. but I have a much bigger house for a, a percentage of what I used to pay in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I have a pool, I have a yard, I have a, you know, a brand new car. I could walk outside. It's I have a beautiful wash outside. I could walk through the desert. It's a great place to live but I've never spent a lot of time here because I'm always on the road. I'd spend 75, 80% of my time traveling. So I really said to myself, you know, this is an opportunity and I'm going to be grateful for the opportunity where I don't have to travel, mm -hmm. where I can work from home or I could not work for a change, probably for the first time in my life where I've not, you know, I, I've just, you know, I've not had to work. So I played a lot of basketball. I worked out a lot. I swam a ton. I was really <laughs> enjoying. I spent time with my kids. Yeah. I spent time cooking for them. I spent time writing a cookbook. My my last book, Peace, Love, and Pasta, which just beautiful book. Came by out. The way. Thank you. It just came out in September, and it was one of those things that I said to myself. I, people always ask me, you know, you know, they ask you too, what do you cook at home? You're a chef, what do you cook at home? So I just decided to write a book about what I cook at home because they're good recipes, and I feel like. If people can, you know, if one person can say, you know, I really like this dish, I'm going to put it in my repertoire. So I'll cook it once or twice a month. That's, that's great. That, then I feel like I've done my job. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've exposed people to something that they wouldn't otherwise think about. Um, and it's good. It's good food. If I, if I do say so myself. <laughs> yeah, I, rem I remember seeing Eric Repair's book, uh, Return to Cooking. Mm. And it was just that. You know, we start out cooking all the yeah. time. You know, mm -hmm. we're the guy doing it. You know, we learn from people. We're cooking. We're line cooks. We're cooks. 
And then there's a point in your career where you start to become a businessman and you yeah. pull away. You, you lose the time and the energy to be creative, you know? And pandemic has reset that. It's given yeah. us the time to return to cooking. And, yeah. uh, and I, that's what I hear you saying. And there's a, there's a, a sweet reward in it all because, um, you know, after a while you start questioning yourself. If you're just, if you're just yeah. a business guy, Am I, is it really my cuisine anymore? Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's not fun. That's not the fun part of it. It's the interesting part, right? There's a lot to learn there, but I don't know about you. I never went to business classes. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. Oh yeah. Big, uh, and money. I've, <laughs> and big money mistakes that I've. <laughs> that's <laughs> tuition, that's baby. That's what that's I call tuition. <laughs> it's a totally different podcast. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, the mistakes, the mistakes were made, but if you can, if you can find the gratitude and still, after all these years of cooking, still love it the way we do. Bobby Flay said to me one day, we, we were shooting his show, and it was just, just before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, we were all talking about, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? What are you doing? What are you doing? And we were all talking about what we were cooking. And right. he said, you know, think about this, man. How fortunate are we? And it's so true. And how fortunate are we that what we do for a living is also what we love to do in our free time? Yeah. And there's really something to be said about that, right? That's true. That's true. I mean, I, I don't, that's where I'm most comfortable. That's the, you know, yeah. just, but it, I don't it want is to be a in blessing. the dining room. I want to be in the kitchen. It is a blessing. And we are, we are blessed to still love it after all these years, to do it in the first place and find the love that we found, to be successful within, within it. You know, I mean, all these years later, we're still, we're still doing it and we still love it as much as we did the first day. If that's not a blessed life, then I don't know what is. I agree. I mean, it's not easy. Just, eh. We want people to be in the business, but you know, it's, uh, right. there's, there's, there's prices to be paid. There's, there's blood, sweat and tears. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I agree with you, but, but if you, if you, if you put all the, you know, all, all that stuff aside and I'm, I'm even thinking these days, like, you know what? I, I don't want to work like I used to work. Why should I ask my team to work? You know, we used to work six days, seven days back in the day. Mm -hmm. I wasn't until my daughter was born that I stopped working seven days a week, my first daughter. But I, but now I'm starting to look at the, you know, you look at the road signs, you look at the roadmap and you say, you know what, maybe this four day work week makes a little bit more sense for the team. They can still keep their 40 hours a week and they, you know, the mental health issues aren't there anymore. Maybe there's, maybe there's something to that, right? I think I, back if you asked me 10 years ago, you asked me 10 years ago, if I would ever think this way, I would have said you're crazy. <laughs> well, we made people work seven days a week because then they couldn't go on job interviews. You know? <laughs> 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 yeah. it's, not, it's true. It's true. <laughs> that's, that's what I was hoping for. I remember there were people standing outside uh, Oceana when I was a chef in New York. There's a guy standing there. He's a, he's a headhunter. Wait for my employees to come out the back door. Yeah. I mean, it was insane, but there yeah. was a certain, there was, a, okay, I'm just going to be real quick because this is, this is a, a comparative to Las Vegas versus New York. Okay. You're, you're East coaster. So am I in heart and soul. Yeah. You know, I don't miss New York as much as I used to, but I back in the day, <laughs> there was a respect between the chefs, you know, like uh, Neil Murphy worked for Charlie Palmer. For eight yeah. Years. Great guy. He came yep. to me and he wanted to work for me. You I need a sous chef right now. As a matter of fact, so-and-so is leaving. I need someone. What was the first thing I would do? Get on the phone with Charlie Palmer. Pick up. Charlie. Okay. Murph. Murph called me. He says he wants to uh, to, to uh, come work over to uh, Oceana, whatever. I'm just throwing names up. And he turned yeah. me back. Oh, man. Oh, shit. Yeah, he's been with me a long time. Great guy. He needs to move on and expand his uh, experience. Uh, so um, can you give me three weeks? Because i got something coming up. i got to take a big. It's sure. No problem. Absolutely. No Vegas, problem. they will sit at your bar and interview your bartender while they're saying hello to you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's true. What happened it's, to that integrity? That's but happened. That's happened, <laughs> <laughs> that's happened yeah, to me yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it's. But you yeah. know, those those stories are fun. It's fun to talk about that stuff because it really it makes you. You didn't realize back in the day that it was going to change, no. and now that it's changed, you look backwards and you say, "Wow, I." That was special. You think about the menus. I know we probably got to go. We could probably talk no, 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 no. about I mean, this stuff. But 
But think about menu items, right? Back in the day, not a single menu in New York City of a, you know, of a certain level, even neighborhood restaurants where Chianti, the first restaurant that I was the chef at, was, was a, a neighborhood restaurant. You always had quail or squab. You always had, and quail was either a main course or, or an appetizer. You always had a sweet bread dish. You always had, you know, you think about these ingredients and, and you're hard pressed now to, to identify any of these menu items on any eclectic menu around right. the country, right? It just doesn't happen anymore. Even duck. You don't see as much duck. Why, you don't see as much there, duck. Why, I mean, chicken everywhere. Why isn't there duck everywhere? I mean. But in three-star restaurants, right? I mean, when you had Oceana, when you had your, your other restaurants, mm-hmm. you know, you had – Remind me of your restaurants again, because I went to all of them, but it was, it was, well, was after Oceana. It was Water Club, yeah. Oceana. Then that's I opened right. up my own restaurant. It was called Restaurant RM. RM, that's it right. So at place. RM, you, you know, you didn't have chicken on the menu back then because you can get chicken anywhere, yeah. right? Yeah. Now you have to have chicken. Even Danielle has chicken on his menu, you know? And of course, it's with morels and caviar and, well, yeah, and yeah, all this it's, it's delicious gilded stuff. It's up to the, to the it, max. It, it, ex- <laughs> exactly. But back in the day, we would never have chicken on the menu because it was just like, you can get chicken any place. You go to El Pollo Loco and get chicken. Like, you don't have to come to our restaurant to get that stuff. You know what I mean? mean? And it's not judgment. It was discernment. We were just trying to put ourselves at a certain level, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's how you stood apart. It's like if you wanted a Wine Spectator Award, you got one here and some leftover thing. Yeah. It's because they own a bottle of, you know, at the Rothschild that was, you know, 1946 when, you know, they started the Victory Label or something, you know, to give you that. So you put things on your menu sometimes just for the status of it. That's right. Not so much for the customer need, want, or whatever, but you felt in your mind and heart and soul that you wanted to introduce new things. That's right. So, That's right. And, or we would do it for you know, fellow chefs who were coming in for the mm-hmm. because you wanted your cooks to learn how to stuff. Yeah. I think I lost your the audio. Did you hit something? Let's see if I can edit this stuff out. <laughs> I can't hear you. No, just went away. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Is it me? Probably me. Probably me. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yeah, now I can hear you. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I just, for some reason, the Bluetooth went out. I apologize. That's okay. But that happens. It was one of those things that we did. We did it for our cooks. We did it for ourselves. We wanted to. We wanted to work with certain product. People would bring in something that was really interesting. We mm-hmm. put it on the menu. Or you get on the phone with the farmer. You stay on the phone. I remember talking to the farmer for an hour and a half and just like send me all this stuff. And then it came in. It was like, what am I going to do with all this stuff? <laughs> it was just so. When you get creative. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have kept you on, on for a long time, and I just want to um, bring this to some sort of a, a sensible conclusion. I just, first of all, want to thank you because uh, I've looked up to you my entire career. I really have. Your food, your ability to assemble a, 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 and create a culture within the establishments that I've had the opportunity to to have your food you know, from Miami um, and to, to everywhere I've been in my, my career. I just want to thank you for your insight, for sharing some of your uh, your your, your roots, the, f- the foundations that brought you to be who you are today and continue to become and evolve. I hope you have 500 restaurants, my friend, that you don't have to be in single one of them someday so you can just relax and enjoy it all and don't reap in the benefit. Like that, <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I will do is make sure that you get your hands on some Forever Oceans uh, Hamachi. We'll have it sent out to you and you get to play with it and do whatever it is uh, that you wish. And, um, from the bottom of my heart, my friend, I thank you and wish you nothing but the finest in life. You're the best chef. I've followed you for years and I really appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. My pleasure. Appreciate you, brother. Right, same here. Foreveroceans.com. <laughs>